The skin or integumental system is probably one of the longest of the systems with regard to slides and information, I think, in the ITEC syllabus. We cover the skin and the different layers, the diseases, but there's also a lot of information and diseases on nails, um, as well as learning about the hair, the hair growth cycle, and the different types of hair. So quite a chunky system, this one, just for five questions. And I must admit, even though originally we used to have a lot of questions on skin conditions, we still do, but we also have had a lot of nail questions recently and a hair question. So it's just as well to have a, a really good overview of the skin. So let's press on and um, complete the skin. We're going to look at the learning objectives of the skin. We're going to look at its structure, its function, where the epidermis and dermis is and what differences there is between the two, the different skin types, the structure and function of the nails, nail disorders, the structure of the hair and the different types of hair, and also the diseases and disorders of the skin. And there are quite a lot of them. The skin is the largest organ of the body and takes up about 16% of body weight covers the whole body. The skin's divided into three layers, the epidermis, the outside layer, the dermis underneath, and the subcutaneous layer. And the department at the hospital that studies problems with the skin is called dermatology. There are eight main functions of the skin, and we're gonna cover these in a little bit more detail later on in the presentation, but the eight are secretion, heat regulation, absorption, protection, elimination, sensation, the production of vitamin D, and melanin. The skin is also known as the integumental or the integumentary system. Epi also means outside, and epithelial tissue is on the outside of the skin. Another name for the skin is also a cutaneous layer. Desquamation is the term given to the shedding of dead skin, and the shedding of the dead skin is then replaced, those cells are replaced by the basal layer. There is no blood supply on the outside of the skin, in order to hit a capillary, you'd have to have quite a deep cut. It would have to go through the epidermis into the lower parts of the skin. There's very little nerve supply as well, just tiny amount of nerves, just to pick up a bit of sensation in the epidermis. And nutrients come from the lymphatic system. But there are five layers to the epidermis, and we need to know what the names of those layers are. And the layers of the skin are the stratum corneum, the stratum lucidum, the stratum granulosum, the stratum spinosum, and the stratum germinavitum. The stratum corneum is the outside surface layer of the skin and it's about 25 to 30 rows of skin make up the stratum corneum. The hardened, flat, dead cells are there for protection. And desquamation is the term given to the sloughing off of dead skin. And as this dead skin is sloughed off, then the basal layer at the very bottom of the five layers pushes the different skin layers up to the top. So the cell membrane is not visible in the stratum corneum. The stratum lucidum is the clear layer. If somebody's lucid, they might be clear and see-through. So clear layer is the second layer of the skin. 
and it is only present on the palms, the fingertips, and the soles of the feet. They are denucleated cells, which means that they don't have any nucleus, and they're not really completely hard. This is where the cell membrane starts to become visible in this part of the cell. So stratum lucidum is a clear layer only present in the palms, fingertips, soles of the feet. The stratum granulosum is a granular layer. This is full of granules of keratin and keratin is what gives the outside of the skin its strength and protection. There are three to five flat rows of stratum granulosum and these cell membranes are starting to die. Stratum spinosum, I always remember, is the spiny or prickly layer of the skin and this is the layer of protection. It's also called the Melpigian layer and it's eight to ten layers of living cells with membranes that interlock with fibrils and spines for protection. Also known as the prickle cell layer. And under friction, especially in the feet and the hands and the pressure on the feet of the hands, then these cells perform mitosis quite rapidly. If you remember mitosis from your cells presentation is the asexual reproduction and the replenishment of cells. Stratum German, German avatum is also known as the single basal layer, and this is the primary site of cell division or mitosis. These cells are living, and it takes between 28 to 30 days for the cells to move through the five layers and then to be desquamated off at the end. This layer also consists of melanocytes that produce melanin, and this gives the skin its color. There are a lot less melanocytes in the skin of white people. There are more in Asian people, but in black skin, they have the most melanocytes in the skin of all. And how do you remember the five layers and which order they come in? So we've got a little rhyme for you. Colin loves green slimy germs. That's how you remember that the corneum is the outside layer, then the lucidum, granulosum, spinosum, and German avatum. Colin loves green slimy germs. The growth and repair of the skin is really down to keratinization. Keratin is a tough fibrous protein that protects the skin. And the cells, as they move through from the basal layer, through the five layers of the epidermis to the corneum, they become more keratinized as they reach the surface. Desquamation is shedding or sloughing off of dead skin cells. And this happens all the time. And we exfoliate our skin in order to encourage that desquamation. I know that quite often when I'm massaging clients, particularly the elderly, if they can't get to their back to exfoliate with a loofah or a brush, then you do find that the elderly sometimes will shed their dead skin all over your couch. I used to offer clients who lived on their own and didn't have the opportunity to have any exfoliation or get somebody else to exfoliate their back. I used to do some body brushing in order to prevent the shedding of the dead skin all over my couch covers. And it would get in between the nails, stuck behind your nails. It wasn't really very pleasant at all. It was like they'd been peeling after sunburning. So the growth and repair cycle of the skin is keratinization protects the skin and desquamation is the name for the shedding of dead skin after 28 to 30 days. The dermis lies underneath the epidermis and is known as the true skin. And this is the layer that consists of blood, nerves, lymphatic vessels, sweat glands, sebaceous glands, hair follicles, and many living cells. 
So the structure of the dermis is that it's mainly made of a combination of different types of connective tissue. It has areolar tissue in it, and in the picture we can see the matrix of the areolar interspersed with white collagen fibers that plump up the skin and make skin look nice and young and fresh. And the more collagen you have in it, the younger looking your skin looks. It also has yellow elastic tissue in it, which contains elastin, which makes it a lot more elastic and springy and keeps it supple. As we get older, we lose the collagen and the yellow elastic um, tissue in the skin. It becomes dry and loses this elasticity and the collagen, so it doesn't look as plump, certainly doesn't look as supple and looks much drier and tends to hang down a little bit and almost come away from the rest of the body in some cases. In the dermis, we have lots of different cells. We can find fibroblasts, which produce areolar tissue and the collagen and elastin that we need in the skin. We can find mast cells. Now, mast cells produce histamine and heparin. Histamine in re reaction to an allergic response. So when we are allergic to something, histamine is produced in the mast cells and then released onto the skin. And that then causes us to have an allergic reaction. We might also take an antihistamine in order to prevent some of the allergic response that we're having. Heparin is an anticoagulant and mast cells also produce heparin, which um, anticoagulant, so it stops blood from clotting. Histocytes are also present in the dermis and they produce histamine as well. And this helps to dilate the blood vessels when we have an allergic response. So in the first instance, if we become allergic to something, particularly if it's topical, if it's on the skin, our blood vessels will dilate and the skin will become red. Also present in the dermis are leukocytes. These are white blood cells that will be fighting off infection. So if we get an infection in the skin, either because we've cut ourselves or we've grazed ourselves, then the white blood cells are our first line of defense in protecting the skin and the body from an invasion through the exterior of the skin. The dermis produces cells, but it also has in it nerve endings. And it's the nerve endings that sense heat, cold, pressure, and pain through the skin. The sweat glands are also found in the dermis, and these are divided into two types. We have ecrine sweat glands and apocrine sweat glands. So the ecrine sweat glands are all over the body, but especially in the hands and the feet. And when we get hot in response to temperature, we produce a watery sweat through the hands and feet. Whereas apocrine glands are only available in the groin and in the armpit. And these produce a milky fluid, which produces body odor. If it's allowed to stay on the skin for too long, the sweat produced in these glands um, has a bacteria growth in it, which gives off uh, an odor. So to be honest, fresh sweat does not smell. It only smells when it's mixed with the bacteria and left on the skin for too long. So ecrine are watery sweat. They're found on the hands and feet. Apocrine is milky fluid and these are found in the groin and the armpit. I like to remember this by saying armpit, apocrine. It's got an A and a P in it. And that's where we get the milky sweat. Hair follicles sit in the dermis and they travel through the dermis and the epidermis. One of the questions we quite often have in the iTech question is, which layer do the hair follicles 
actually protrude from. And protruding from then is obviously going to be the epidermis, whereas the dermis is where they start from. The erector pili muscle is a little muscle that controls temperature. So when we get cold in particular, the hair stands upright, trapping air and um, giving us a look on the skin like goose pimples. The erector pili muscle is a little bit defunct for human beings now. In animals, this is a much bigger muscle and plays a much more important part for standing hair. If you think of a cat, a frightened cat, um, how much their hair stands on end whereas um, and makes them look bigger at the same time and more scary to anybody that's trying to hunt them. Whereas it's not very often really that, that we feel our erector pillow muscles working. We have to get particularly cold to have goosebumps and that's the only reaction we have these days. The sebaceous glands connect to hair follicles and produce sebum. So sebum comes from sebaceous. The sebum acts as a lubrication on the skin, which provides a pH balance on the skin of 4.5 to 5.6. Sweat and sebum combined help to maintain the acid mantle on the skin. And this is important for preventing bacterial growth. Bacteria don't really like much acid, so anything that's acidic, like the hydrochloric acid in the stomach and the acid mantle on the skin, are going to be very good for stopping bacterial growth on the skin. The blood supply can be found in the dermis, as can the lymphatic capillaries and the microscopic capillaries that provide oxygen and nutrients to all the cells are found in the dermis. So are the lymphatic capillaries offering defense and fluid drainage from the tissues of the skin. And the dermal papilla is a, at the base of the hair and contains the blood vessels, nerves, supplying the hair with nutrients. This is a question that comes up quite a lot. Where does the hair get its nutrients? And this is the dermal papilla. Now there are two layers to the dermis, there's a papillary dermis and there's a reticular dermis. And one of the questions we had in the iTech paper a few years ago was about the deep reticular layer, which is the very deep part of the dermis, which contains the roots of hairs, the sebaceous glands, the sweat glands, the receptors, the nails and the blood vessels. The functions of the skin are secretion, heat regulation, absorption, protection, elimination, sensation, the production of vitamin D and the production of melanin. Add these together and they spell shapes VM. Let's talk about them in a little bit more detail on the next slides. Secretion of the skin happens when the sebum and the sebaceous glands um, produce the sebum, which lubricates the hair shaft and the outside of the skin. And sebum and sweat combined produce that acid mantle which moisturizes and works as an antibactericidal on the skin. So again, we've got this acid mantle which is combined by the sebum and the sweat which moisturizes the skin and produces an antibactericidal effect. The more sebum we have being produced by the sebaceous gland, the more oily our skin is going to be. Heat is regulated by the skin and the temperature of the body is 36.8. And heat tends to be produced by the organs, the muscles, the liver and the digestive system. 
and the subcutaneous layer of the skin um, is full of adipose tissue. Now this helps to insulate and keep the heat in the body. How the skin is also controlled is through vasodilation and vasoconstriction of the blood vessels. And when we are particularly hot, the blood vessels in the body vasodilate, which means that they have a cooling effect. So the capillaries and the pores dilate on the skin, and this has a hyperemic effect on the skin, a sort of flush to the skin and produces sweating. Hyperemia means a sudden rush of blood to an area, and in this case it means the skin. Vasoconstriction happens when um, we need to keep warm and we're feeling cold. So vasoconstriction has a warming effect on the skin and the blood to the major organs, capillaries, and pores contract, the erective pili muscles contract, and we start shivering to keep ourselves warm. Absorption takes place through the skin. Drugs, essential oils can be absorbed through the skin, but the absorption is only as good as the health of the skin and the condition of the skin. And one thing we can't do is if we are eliminating from the skin, giving things out of the skin like sweat, we cannot absorb at the same time. The skin can only do one or the other. And if it's absorbing through the skin, it can't eliminate at the same time. So the drugs that we can have absorbing through the skin could be in patches like HRT, nicotine patches. We might have a topical ointment that we put onto the skin for psoriasis or eczema. Different types of creams can be recommended and drugs absorbed through the skin. Essential oils are massaged into the skin and they then absorb into the bloodstream of the body. And this can happen through the layers of the skin or the hair, through the sweat glands, through the different layers of the skin. The protection of the skin is maintained by that acid mantle on the skin and the pH levels of the skin act as a barrier. Melanin protects the skin and our bodies from UV rays from the light and the damage that it can be done onto the skin. The sensory nerves pick up any danger with regard to heat and cold extremes of temperatures and um, any problems that we might suffer from the skin, any damage will be picked up by the sensory nerves. So this is how the skin is protected. Elimination, we get rid of toxins and waste products through the skin via sweat. This mostly consists of water and salts. And if you ever taste the sweat that comes out of your body, it's often quite salty. Sensation is felt by the skin through the nerve endings. These nerve receptors can be found at different levels of the skin, and they pick up different sensations like pain, cold, heat, pressure, touch. And when we do the nervous system, we will cover a thing called a reflex arc, and a reflex arc is where normally the nerve sensations, the senses, will come up through the sensory nerve to the brain for interpretation and back through a motor nerve to form an action. But in an emergency, if it's a violent heat, violent cold reaction that we need an immediate response for, this is called a reflex arc and it happens really quickly. It comes through the sensory nerve, the sensation to the spinal cord, and instead of going all the way up to the brain for interpretation and back, a reflex arc will initiate a response straight away through a motor nerve in order to protect the body. So it's quite clever stuff. Vitamin D is being discovered to be really vital for bone formation and maintenance. Stimulated by ultraviolet light, this is converted by ergosterol, 
to vitamin D. And excess vitamin D is stored in the liver. Lack of vitamin D causes rickets in children. And now we know that dementia is, it's vital in dementia that we have plenty of vitamin D. Dehydrocholesterol is a steroid which we have present in the skin, which enables the manufacture of vitamin D by sunlight. So when the skin is in the sun, the dehydrocholesterol is what is present in the skin that enables us to manufacture vitamin D. We have had one question on dehydrocholesterol over the last nine years, but only one. Melanin formation is stimulated by the melanin stimulating hormone. Melanocytes produce the melanin and this can be found in the stratum germinavitum or the basal layer. And this helps to darken the skin to protect it from the sun's rays. And the dark colors are absorbed by radiation. So the darker the skin, the more protected to UV rays they are. So it is melanin production that protects the skin, but the darker the skin, the more radiation is absorbed. We're going to look at the nail now and some of the quite complicated names attached to different parts of the nail. The hypernetium is the skin at the end of the finger underneath the free edge. So the free edge at the end of the finger that sticks out over your fingertip is the hypernetium is just underneath it. Epinetium attaches to the nail bed and moves with it as the nail bed grows. So the epinetium is the name of the skin underneath the nail plate and moves with it as the nail plate grows. The nail bed is the part of the nail that the nail plate rests on. So it's also a continuation of the nail matrix. The nail matrix is the only living, reproducing part of the nail. Everything else is dead. And this is situated directly below the cuticle. The nail plate is the visible nail that rests on the nail bed up to the free edge. So the whole of the top of the nail is known as the nail plate. It's a good idea to draw this diagram, I think, and label it in order to get your names um, clearly in your head as to what's called what, and to practice the pronunciation. So let's say those again. Hypernetium, Epinetium, Nail Bed, Nail Matrix, and the Nail Plate. So the free edge is the edge of the nail. Paranetium is the term for the soft tissue surrounding the border of the fingernail and the toenail. Lununa, like um, the moon, is also the half moon crescent shaped white area at the proximal nail, so the nearest end to your body. And the nail mantle is the fold of skin in front of the cuticle. This protects the nail the nail matrix. The cuticle is the overlapping bit of the nail that comes around the nail at the proximal end. It's an overlapping piece of dermis that protects the matrix. The nail fold, this means that this is nearest attached end of soft tissue that protects the emerging nail plate. The nail wall is the skin that covers the sides of the nail plate. Nails take about six months to grow from the lanula, the proximal end, down to the distal edge. Proximal means that it's the nearest to the body and distal means it's the furthest away. The health of the nail is really decided by how healthy we are. And factors that affect the nail growth are if we're feeling well or not, um, how healthy we are, our age, our diet, what medication we're on can affect your nail growth, 
the climate that we live in, the damage that we've done to our nails and our lifestyle. I often find that when I go on holiday, my nails grow enormously quickly. We're going to go through the nail disorders now, and pitting lines is where the nail looks a little bit like a sewing thimble. They can be linked to minor nail trauma or even psoriasis, and there's a sort of pitting within the nail. Ridges are quite common, particularly as we get older. Vertical ridges in the nail in middle age. I've often been told that this is a sign of arthritis when you have um, vertical nails, ridges. White spots are often caused by a minor trauma or a calcium or zinc deficiency. Leukonychia is white nail syndrome. That's the top picture on this slide. This can occur with arsenic poisoning, heart disease, renal failure, or pneumonia. So that's leukonychia. Onycholis is a name where the separation of the nail plate from the nail bed, if you can see that in the middle picture, where it's a little bit brown at the proximal end, the nail is actually not attached to the nail bed. This can result in infection or long fingernails that happens with as well and quite often where there's inflammation. Yellow nails is different from nicotine nails, which we'll have later on. Yellow nails are due to a lymphatic obstruction in cardio cardiopulmonary disease. So yellow nails are more to do with the lymphatic obstruction in um, cardiopulmonary disease. Brown nails is often linked to nicotine staining or chemotherapy you can have brown nails in. Collinichia is where the nail curves upwards due to an iron deficiency. You can see that in the middle picture there. Onychocryptosis is a condition where the toenail penetrates through the surrounding skin and resulting in discomfort and pain. Often removal or Injured, of the injured part is necessary. So that's onychocryptosis. Say that, onychocryptosis. And cholinicha. Not easy words, are they? Paranicha is one of the questions we were asked in the last exam paper. This affects the nail fold, which becomes swollen and lifted from the edge of the nail, and it appears red and tender. So I get quite a lot of that paranecia affecting the nail fold, which is um, the most proximal part of the nail. Bose lines are transverse ridges that go from side to side, and there's a temporary nail growth cessation due to illness. So this represents a time when the nail didn't grow because of illness and they're ridges that grow from side to side and they're known as bows lines. Onycholysis affects 10% of the population. This is a fungal infection of the nail, it can be of the fingernails or the toenails. So say these, paranechia, bows lines, onycholysis. Curved or concave nails are an indication of health problems, particularly that top picture in the right. That's an example of curved or concave nails. Blue nails reflects poor circulation. A whitlow is an infection at the tip of the finger or the side. Anywhere around the nail you can have a whitlow really, but it's usually at the side, the tip. A habit tick produces a series of transverse lines like bow lines but they're right in the middle of the nail they're, they're not exactly all the way across indicating a trauma to the nail matrix as the nail is being formed this is formed by a habit and it means that the nail will grow like this because of this trauma so it might 
happen constantly. Tinea angium is a fungal infection, a sort of form of ringworm where the nails are disfigured. You can see that in the middle picture. Tinea pedis is also a fungal infection, and this is another name for athlete's foot. You can't see that clearly on this picture, but these toes are itchy, red, they become painful, very contagious. And this is known as tinea pedis, or athlete's foot. Types of hair growth. Hair is found all over the body, except for the palms, the soles of the feet, the lips, and the external genitalia. The types of hair that we have on the body, we've got three types. Lanugo is the hair that we have inside the womb or inside the uterus as the baby's growing and quite often most babies don't have any hair when they are born all over their body but they might have a very fine little baby hair that's all over the body that sheds within the first few weeks of life. Vellus is a fine down hardly visible hair that we have all over our bodies. Terminal hair is the thick, long, sometimes post-puberty hair. It's very dark. It's what we have on the... Um, it's not dark if you're blonde, but if it's thick. So what we have on the scalp, eyebrows, underarms, legs, on a man's chest, that is terminal hair. Apparently, something I didn't know was that if you have your fine vellus hair on your legs and you start shaving your vellus hair on your legs it will turn into terminal type hair so it's coarser and thicker and resembles the sort of hair you've got on your head and if you'd never shaved your legs it would still be nice fine hardly noticeable um, hair factors that affect your hair growth can be hormonal um, the more testosterone you have in the body, um, the more hirsute you can become, so the more hairy you can become. Age affects hair growth. A lot of men and women suffer from thinning hair as they get older. Um, nothing to do with male pattern baldness, but um, certainly to do in age, hair can get very much thinner. The colour of hair varies as you get older as well. Um, and the type of hair growth varies with the colour. Stress, we can have alopecia, which is a loss of hair due to stress. Medication can affect your hair, particularly if you're suffering from cancer and you have chemotherapy, you can lose your hair because of the medication you're on. And your health and diet will affect the growth of your hair. Medical conditions can affect your hair growth. Hereditary conditions like the male pattern baldness is very hereditary. Part of the body um, affects how much hair you have. And the seasons of the body affects how much hair growth you have, as well as your race and origin will de depend on what type of hair growth you have. There are three hair growth cycles, or three stages to your hair growth. And these are known as anagen, catagen, and telogen. And if you think of them as ACT, A-C-T, anagen is the active part of the hair growth. Catagen is the changing part of the hair growth. And telogen is the tired or resting part of the hair growth. So anagen is the active, and it goes from active then to changing between being active and resting. So anagen, catagen, telogen. That's the growth cycle of the hair. We have it really actively growing one minute, and then it sort of um, changes from being active and starts to change towards being a tired, resting hair growth, and then it falls out, and then gets pushed up underneath by a new, active, growing hair. 
Skin disorders and diseases are divided into different categories. We've got congenital. That means that it's familial, it's something you're born with. We have bacterial, which is a bacterial infection, a virus or a viral, um, a fungal infection caused by a fungus. We have pigmented disorders and a general selection of burns and cancers. We also have infestations as well, so conditions of the skin that are caused by uh, parasites infecting our skin. So we're going to go through these. There's quite a few, so we're going to take it in bite-sized chunks um, and take it slowly. We do get questions a lot about the diseases of the skin. Eczema is a congenital disorder which tends to run in families, very linked to hay fever and asthma as well. Normally, if you get eczema in the family, maybe somebody else will have asthma or hay fever. Um, eczema can be all over the body, but it's mostly maybe inside the knee, elbow, joints, maybe the face, hands, and scalp. It's a dry, itchy patch, not contagious. I started having eczema behind my knees when I was a child and behind my ears, and so did one of my sisters. Um, and I have had eczema all over my hands in the past, but very rarely now. Very stress-related with me, and um, does tend to come up when I'm stressed, if I get too, too stressed. But very congenital, congenital and familial. Another congenital disease is psoriasis. This is known also as chronic inflammatory disease and is defined by red patches and silvery scales. So there's a lot of sort of erythema, red patches, silvery scales, affects the whole body or specific areas. It's not contagious, but it is, can be a very, very uncomfortable disease. Now we're on some of the bacterial diseases. Acne vulgaris is a bacterial disease and is mostly hormonally um, related. Particularly in puberty, people get acne vulgaris and also later in life it can come back. Um, mostly a hormonal imbalance and mostly affects the face, back, chest and shoulders. It's not contagious, but people who have really bad acne vulgaris can be very um, sensitive and self-conscious. Folliculitis is probably one of the most common ITEC questions of all. We get questions about which of the following is a bacterial disease and questions about what type of disease is folliculitis. So it's an infection of the hair follicle. It's usually a sort of pilosebaceous duct inflammation. So it's the sebaceous duct attacking attacking, attaching to the hair follicle, and it's very linked with acne. Oils are usually infected with bacteria. Infection of the skin, it can either be an inflammation around a hair follicle or it can be um, a boil on the skin. Impetigo is highly contagious. It's a bacterial infection that appears as a sort of thin roofed blisters, usually yellow, encrusted and weeping. Um, nastier than a cold sore, but very yellow and crusty, highly contagious. So you do need to not share flannels and towels and touch impetigo. Acne rosacea is a bacterial infection and this is usually on the face it's flushed red in appearance and not at all contagious. A carbuncle is a small shallow collection of abscesses which are connected under the skin. That's a bacterial infection. MRSA, which is methicillin resistant, it's a Staphylococcus aureus is what it stands for. Um, and this is prevalent in hospitals at the moment. 
and MRSA is, is not easy for anybody to get rid of. Tea tree oil is apparently the only thing to um, kill off MRSA on a culture grown in a laboratory. Viruses. Warts are a virus. They're a sort of small horny tumour often found on the fingers and thumbs and highly contagious, which is quite frightening when you think that as when I went to a Catholic school as a child under the age of sort of 10, I had to hold the hands of this small little lad and we had to go in two by two to church and he had a hand covered in warts, which used to horrify me. And the fact that it's highly contagious horrifies me even more now. Um, so warts are usually found on the th fingers and thumbs, highly contagious, and verrucas are also highly contagious, and they are normally warts of the feet, which are highly contagious. The virus, viral infections tend to embed itself in the cells, and although the verruca and the wart might actually go away, they can come back again if you don't actually manage to get rid of the virus within the cell. Herpes simplex and herpes zoster are both viruses. Herpes simplex is the common name, not the common name, for a common cold sore. Um, yeah, it's another name for the common cold sore. Um, mostly found around the mouth, but they can spread and they are highly contagious when they're active. Herpes zoster is another name for shingles and acts as a form of chicken pox, but again is highly contagious. So herpes simplex and herpes zoster are viral infections. Fungal infections are tinea corporis and candida. Tinea corporis is the Latin name for ringworm and it's a very common, highly infectious skin infection that causes a sort of ring-like rash, red rash on the skin. It's often picked up out in the countryside from um, gates, wooden gates and posts in the countryside and horse riders seem to pick up fungal infections of ringworm quite a lot. But it is extremely contagious and certainly if you were doing a treatment you wouldn't want a client coming for a, a treatment with ringworm. Candida is a yeast infection normally found in the mouth, the digestive tract and the vagina. And you can have candidiasis, which is a sort of um, overproduction of the yeast infection in the stomach. The parasitical infestations of the body are pediculosis capitis, pediculosis corporis and scabies. Pediculosis capitis is another name for head lice. The Latin for head is capitis. This is an infection of the scalp and the hair common in children, but um, it affects clean hair rather than dirty hair. So the cleaner the head, the more likely you are to pick up head lice. And I've tried to find a really good picture of the eggs that are in the hair in this picture and this is a picture of the, the um, lice as well there because although my son went through school and we thought we had head lice on many occasions I never really knew what I was looking for we never had them but um, there is a sort of hysteria that it goes with head lice that makes you start to itch and the treatment for it is a really nasty cream that everybody has to use to make sure that nobody has the head lice so pediculosis capitis is head lice. Pediculosis corporis is the same lice, but it's in the body. So it will be hair in other areas of the body, like the groin under the armpit, maybe chest hair. Scabies is highly contagious and they enter the body through often the fingers or the toes or even the genitalia. And it causes an itch. It's a female mite that causes an itch and burrows under the horny layer of the skin, um, the spinosum layer. 
and uh, lays her eggs and it's often recognised by, you see on the right hand side of that picture, there's a sort of line of spotty scabs and it's often a line as the lice or the mite rather buries its way up through the body. So in this case this would have entered the body in the fingers. So parasitical infections then, pediculosis capitis, pediculosis corporis and scabies and the type of question you might get is which of the following is not a parasitical infection and which of the following is, what type of infection is scabies, that type of question. The pigmented disorders are vitiligo and albinism or albino as we call them more commonly. Vitiligo is a complete loss of colour in an area of the skin. Um, it's not contagious, it's not caused by bacteria, it's a pigment in the skin um, where you've got no colour. Michael Jackson was the most famous person who suffered from vitiligo. Albinism is where there's a complete lack of melanocytes in the skin. So the melanocytes in the basal layer or the spinum germ of an are not producing melanin. So there's no pigmentation in the skin, the hair or the eyes and this is an inherited condition. So that's albinism or an albino has no melanocytes, no colour in the hair, skin or eyes. Continuing with pigmented disorders, cloasma is a butterfly mask on the skin at the upper cheeks, the nose, possibly the forehead, particularly during pregnancy. This cloasma, this pattern might arrive. So that's cloasma, a butterfly mask usually in pregnancy. Ephylides are freckles. That's the Latin name or the medical name for freckles, ephylides, and most commonly seen on the face, but can be seen on the arms, the legs. You can have freckles anywhere on the body, really, but mainly the face. So ephylides are freckles, and cloasma is a butterfly mask, often in pregnancy. Continuing with pigmented disorders, lentigo is also known as liver spots. These are dark patches of pigmentation that you get in older age and are quite common all over the body. They're not malignant, they're not a problem, um, they just don't look particularly attractive depending on where they are. So lentigo are known as liver spots. Moles, we have two types of moles. We have um, sessile, which are flat and pedunculated which are raised and both types of moles are also known as a papilloma. So these are quite normal, quite common, usually run in families, you get some people whose whole family are much more moly than others. So moles known as papilloma, flat is sessile, raised are pedunculated. Nevi are also a pigmented disorder, nevi and port wine stains. Now nevi are birthmarks and they're like a pinhead to several centimetres in width and they vary in colour but the most common one is a strawberry birthmark. This one that you can see here on the top picture is of a baby with a strawberry birthmark, that's quite a big one. Port wine stain is where the, there's a large area of dilated capillaries which permanently have tainted and coloured the, the skin so that it's pink to, to dark red skin colour which is permanent. But it is usually people are born with this and it's known as a port wine stain, a large dilated area of capillaries. We have had questions in the exam about nevi and port wine stains. There are three types of burn and these burns are defined by how deep the burn is. A first degree burn is a superficial burn. This is usually in the epidermis. There's a bit of redness, swelling. Um, it's very superficial and usually not too serious. It won't involve any of the other layers underneath. 
So it'll just be red, maybe a bit swollen, but it's only of the epidermis, the outer layer of the skin. The second degree burn, there is redness, there's swelling, there's maybe blistering, there's damage which extends deeper into the layers of the dermis. So this is a deeper and probably more painful burn because this then will involve the deep nerves deep within the dermis as well as the little superficial one. The third degree burns are what they call full thickness burns and there's no pain here because the nerves actually have been damaged and there isn't any pain at all but you can see that this um, burn is charred, it's black and there's a complete death to a lot of the cells here so it's, it's full thickness, no pain destroys the entire depth of the skin, causing significant scarring. There's damage to the whole skin, the fat, the muscle, possibly even the bone. So this is what we call a full thickness burn, a third degree burn. So a first degree burn is super just the epidermis, maybe a little bit of redness and swelling. A second degree burn is where there's blistering, there's damage to the deeper layers, layers of the dermis, swelling and redness and third degree burn which is full thickness probably no pain but it, it does destroy tissue and there would be significant scarring um, even if you didn't have to have some form of graft to cover this wound. Crow's feet are the normal signs of aging and laughter that we get around the eyes associated as we get older. Urticaria is also known as hives or nettle rash and it's extreme allergic reaction to something. Normally um, nuts is often a cause of urticaria and it, there's a lot of production of histamine in the skin so the skin becomes red, blotchy, the swelling. I've had five bouts of urticaria and, and before the rash even came onto my body, before I even saw the rash, I ended up, my head started to itch and then as I scratched it, it became swollen and I ended up looking a bit like the Incredible Hulk and had to have steroid injections to bring it down. Um, never found out what I'm allergic to, but it followed then, after the swelling, I then ended up with a blotchy rash that seemed to want to cover my whole body. So it can be quite serious because if parts of the body swell, like the throat swells or the head swells, then that can put pressure on the brain and also put pressure on, on, on your breathing. So urticaria is an extreme allergic reaction and the rash is known as hives or nettle rash. Comedones that we can see here on this lady's forehead are blackheads. They are trapped, hardened, sebaceous secretions. So these are blackheads, known as comedones. Or I used to call them, used to be a black band years ago called the Commodores. And I used to remember this, um, comedones were blackheads. So crow's feet, uh, aging lines around the eyes. Urticaria is an allergic reaction known as hives and comedones are blackheads. Dermatitis is an umbrella term for an allergic inflammation of the skin. There's usually erythema, which is redness, itching, uh, maybe skin lesions where the skin is broken, but it's not contagious. And it might be an irritation to soap, anything that you come into contact with, maybe um, washing powder, something you've changed in your normal habits at home. Amelia or milia are known as white heads. This is where the sebum is trapped in a blind duct. So with milia and blackheads um, or comedones, exfoliation on a regular basis should stop the trapping of sebum in a blind duct and it should stop the blackheads, the sebum hardening in the skin. Blisters are, are pockets of fluid in the upper layers of the skin, normally due to friction or rubbing, 
And the treatment these days, we used to burst them with a pin. These days, the treatment is to leave them alone and let them heal on their own. A cyst, which we can see behind the ear in the top right picture, is a closed sac with distinct membrane around it and it contains air, fluids or semi-solid material. It might be pus. It might have solidified a little bit. So a cyst is normally either full of air or fluid or semi-solid solid matter like pus. A keloid scar is an overgrown scar that's overgranulated and that spreads out from the original area of the skin damage and gets a bit bigger. It might be raised on the skin. This is this is the worst example I could find, almost looks like a slug on this person's skin underneath the chin. So they may well have had some sort of incision, um, maybe a thyroidectomy, tracheotomy, something like that. Um, it does look like a slug, but it is a keloid scar. And we can have a keloid scar on any part of the body and it's just where it's overgranulated. So the cells have repaired and formed a scar, but they've overgranulated. So instead of staying flush with the body and the rest of the skin, they've it's got bigger. And in this case, it's quite a large keloid scar. Sometimes you can have them removed, and I should imagine that this person might well have that scar removed. Striae or stretch marks are characterized by the thinning of the connective tissue and maybe the stroma as produced and it's linear or atrophic appearance on the skin that's quite complicated but it stretch marks basically when you put on weight very quickly um, the skin stretches and it stretches without the amount of elasticity and collagen to allow it to stretch and it, and it stretches and causes these silvery stroma or striae stretch marks in the skin and when you lose weight again they become very obvious so it's normally either in pregnancy when the skin is stretched over the stomach because the baby grows and if the baby quickly or if you put on a lot of weight very quickly for one reason or another so a cyst is a closed sac with a distinct membrane maybe full of fluid or pus a keloid scar is an overgrown scar and stretch marks or, or striae are as a result of the thinning of that connective tissue because of um, very rapid increase in size. Thin skin tears really easily and our skin gets thinner and thinner as we get older. Once we reach a certain age, we stop producing as much elastin for the skin and collagen for the skin, which gives us that plump um, protection as well, the, the elasticity of the skin. And the skin becomes papery, it breaks easier, more easily and becomes a lot thinner. We don't replenish our cells as well as we did before. So moisturising the skin and that whole action of rubbing the skin with a moisturiser is really good for stimulating the blood flow, moisturising the skin, putting back some of the moisture there and not allowing the skin to get too dry, cracked or chapped. So in this top picture we can see here that the skin of the foot in particular has um, become very thin and easily broken. A filiformis is just a skin tag. You might find on your skin that there are these little benign skin growths caused by friction. They're often in places where maybe if you wear a necklace, you'll get a skin tag around your neck. So that's a filiformis. A xanthoma is where fat builds up under the surface. And these are normally red and shiny, as you can see in the picture at the bottom of the um, presentation. You don't normally get that many xanthomas, but like everything, it's always easier to show you a picture, which is the worst case scenario. Normally, you know, most of us might have one xanthoma. You might have a few more, um, but this is fat that builds up under the surface of the skin. 
So thin skin, we usually find, you find in the elderly and tears and breaks easily. Filiformis is a skin tag. It's a benign little growth of skin. You can have them removed. You can have them lasered um, if they irritate you. And a xanthoma is where the fat builds up under the surface of the skin. Sudiferous gland disorders. Bromidrosis and osmidrosis are a condition which causes foul-smelling perspiration. Anhydrosis is the ability to sweat at all. Usually where there's an A or an AN in front of any word, it means there's the absence of. So anhydrosis or anhydrosis is the inability to sweat at all. And hyperhidrosis is excessive sweating. So if you think of the term um, hydrosis as being sweating, then bromidrosis and osmidrosis are foul-smelling perspiration. Anhydrosis is the inability to sweat at all, and hyperhidrosis is excessive, excessive sweating. As we know that hyper means too much, much of something. Pressure sores or bed sores are really painful, and when I was nursing, we would have to prevent bed sores and pressure sores with patients who were in bed all the time. The areas where the bone touch the bed are going to be areas where potentially you could have a pressure sore or a bed sore, particularly in a patient that doesn't move around very much. So here we can see some really nasty bed sores on the ankles. You can also have them on the lower end of the spine, on the coccyx or the sacrum, quite often on the elbows or even on the scapula. And the way to prevent bed sores is to turn your patient on a regular basis or to keep moving when you're in bed and to make sure that you rub and improve the circulation on these areas on a regular basis. And we used to do a sort of hourly um, pressure sore round where we would massage the heels and the buttocks and the elbows and any area that was touching um, the mattress for any length of time and providing pressure on the skin. So it is to do with lying in, lying in any particular area for any length of time and patients that are particularly prone to these would be um, paralysed patients who have no feeling, unconscious patients who are not moving around at all, maybe the elderly or somebody's really sick, um, somebody who's in bed for an awful long period of time. Pressure ulcers can range in severity. You know, they can be tiny little patches or they can be big open wounds and exposed to the underlying bone even at the bottom of them. The different treatments over the years that I was nursing were unbelievable. Prevention really is the key. Um, we used everything from gentian violet to um, egg whites and oxygen where we used to put egg white on the wound and wheel the patient in their bed out into the sunlight to let the sun get at it. Um, everything tried from different sort of plaster type things, healing plasters to put on them. But really, I mean, there is no excuse for getting a pressure sore or a bed sore if you've got good nursing care going on. But definitely rubbing and getting the circulation going. Cellulitis is a very common but potentially serious bacterial skin infection, particularly if it's in an area where it's difficult to heal, whether if a patient has difficulty in healing cell regeneration, if it breaks the skin. Scleroderma is a chronic autoimmune disease characterized by fibrosis or hardening of the different parts of the body. It can start off with things like Raynaud's disease, which is where the tips of the fingers go either red, white or blue and are very cold and very painful. It can also mean that the skin on the fingers become very hard and different parts of the body start hardening. People have difficulty swallowing. 
um, without drinking water, and it's a chronic autoimmune disease. Um, they have trouble biting in the extreme stages um, an apple or opening their mouth wide enough. And different parts of the body will start to cause them problems with pain and changes in the skin. And it's characterized by this fibrosis or hardening of the muscle tissue and the, and the skin in the body. Systemic lupus erythematosus is a, another chronic inflammatory disease. It affects the joints. Um, it's similar to arthritis, so this, the symptoms initially would be similar to arthritis, but it also sometimes has a rash on the skin. It can be very serious if it's not treated because it does affect long term the kidneys, the blood and the nervous system. So systemic lupus erythematosus or SLE is quite a, a serious condition. So here we have cellulitis, scleroderma and systemic lupus erythematosus. I have attached um, a little video of systemic lupus erythematosus. I thought that might just reinforce what we've discussed. A basal cell carcinoma happens on exposed parts of the body where we've been in the sun. Normally you'll find this on people who have lived abroad or have spent a lot of time abroad without any sun protection. These might be people like the father who was in the Marines. He ended up with basal cell carcinoma of his ear and on parts of his face and on his chest. So this can often occur on the face, nose, eyelids, cheeks. And it should really be removed. I mean, he had several of these basal cell carcinomas removed. And my mother-in-law who lived in South Africa, she's had basal cell carcinomas removed on the face as well. Squamous cell carcinomas, these are cells on the top layer of the skin caused again by sunlight and chemicals or irritants and they start small but they grow very rapidly and they become raised. A malignant tumour of melanocytes is a malignant melanoma. This is normally develops from a benign mole so you might have had a mole for quite some time and suddenly it starts to change shape. It gets larger, it unevenly spreads out, it becomes darker, maybe more ulcerated, and maybe different and darker in places. So as we can see in this bottom malignant melanoma, we can see that on the left hand side it's much darker and then it's a variation of colour in the middle and then a darker again on the right hand side. So any mole that you've had for a long time that suddenly changes shape, gets darker, larger, becomes ulcerated or spreads um, particularly unevenly does need to be checked out. So here we have different types of skin cancers. We have basal cell carcinoma which obviously affects the basal cells. We've got squamous cell carcinoma and we've got malignant melanoma. In this slide I've just reinforced the um, malignant melanoma that we had on the slide before by, sometimes I think it's useful when you're working with the general public as a therapist that you, you're in a good position to be actually able to spot a melanoma much more easily perhaps than your client. And I've been in a position over the years where I've spotted three changes in moles on the skin and particularly on the back and the legs where your client can't actually see very clearly. Quite often we are the first line of noticing these types of things. So it's, it's a useful thing to know what different skin conditions look like. And there's quite a horrific book called the A to Z of skin conditions. But it, it's quite graphic, but it is very useful for any therapist or anybody who's working with the general public closely to recognise the different skin conditions, particularly the contagious ones, 
and the um, ones that potentially had changes in moles in particular are very, very useful. So well done for completing the skin presentation. And if you want to move on and test your knowledge with your test paper, that'd be great.